I'm sorry if I'm slightly distracted. I'm just reading all the wonderful comments from everyone. Barbara Wells said she missed me. So sweet, so sweet. Uh, someone said this is the favorite part of their day. Madeline, thank you so much. This is, this is becoming my favorite part of the day because I get to be around people and the only way we can be around people uh, and that's here on the Producers Perspective Live. Welcome back, everyone. It is Wednesday, right? Wednesday night. A very special guest in the house tonight. We have superstar set designer David Korins. Now, he did that little show you've never heard of called Hamilton. The other one you've never heard of called Dear Evan Hansen. I have to say this slower so Mary can catch up because she's just a little slow on the trigger. She's a little like a like a stage manager that is just a little go go uh beetlejuice was beetlejuice in there i was too busy riffing there to fill that up uh he also did my production of godspell back in 2011 and he also did my apartment that's right the hamilton set designer once designed my apartment not this one however he didn't pick out this wallpaper we'll find out if he likes it or not or those lights uh so we'll see what he thinks that could be the most dramatic part of this entire uh live stream whether or not david corins likes my new apartment anyway we are here for the actors fund don't forget about the actors fund they are going to really need your help in the next month it was all a ramp up now is when just like the unemployment claims are like coming in like crazy here come the claims from everyone in the entertainment industry okay so don't forget about them and a fun way that you can help is that you can throw stars at david corins like a ninja you can throw Facebook stars at him just like this. It's just like throwing cash and we'll take all that cash, all your stars, and we'll throw them to the actress fund. So have some fun, throw us some stars. Who are we getting? Th Ali Stroker or someone threw some stars at her at the other day. Uh, no one threw, did we get stars for Michael Arden and Andy last night? That was one of our more popular episodes. Mary, did we get any stars? No, she's not, no. All right, we need to make up, and Michael and Andy, they showed us their damn puppy last night, for God's sake. Someone please throw us some stars for them, for David Corins, who's going to be up in just a moment. Don't forget to stay safe, stay healthy, and stay home. We are really getting through this year. We're powering through this thing in New York, but it is not over yet. Not over yet, so please make sure you do so. Uh, speaking of the governor, so they announced this um, this huge advisory committee today featuring leaders of all sorts of industry from across the state to help reopen New York City. Danny Meyer from the restaurant uh, restaurateur, Danny Meyer, um, CEO of Etsy, I think was there, like all these incredible business leaders, not one from Broadway, not effing one of them. It's, I feel like it was a mistake, like someone just hasn't returned his call yet. Anyway, hopefully that was a mistake because there is nothing more important to this city and this state than Broadway. We are such a symbol to the health of New York City. So hopefully we will get someone to help get on that committee and advise the governor. Maybe it will be tonight's guest. Let's bring him on and see if he would answer the call if Governor Cuomo picked up the phone. David Corins, would you agree to serve on the reopening committee for New York City? How's that for a lead-in? Yes, I would agree to serve. All right, uh, we're just going to dive right in. That was, I, we were in the, I would, wow, it's been a minute. I was waiting. What an intro. How exciting. Hello, Ken. Um, how are you? I'd be better if I was on that committee to help open Broadway. What would you do? Like, what would be one of your ideas? I have no idea. It would just be exciting to have a job. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, I, I do. I do know what you're saying. Honestly, I, honestly, I mean, we were chatting like for four seconds before I, I uh, oh my God, look, the things just pop up right there. Don't yeah, you say it. anything, Daniel Bell, unless you're throwing a star, whatever the hell that means. That's right. Someone throw a star. Throw stars, people. Come on. Um, uh, here's the thing. I feel like it's all window dressing until there's a vaccine. That's my personal feeling. I feel scared about that. Um, but I'm excited to be here talking about it. There was some good news today. There, there, were, there was a couple of things. Fauci got a little more optimistic today. There was another British vaccine yesterday or something. And feel, I just keep thinking that someone is going to make so much effing money on this vaccine that they're going to have to speed it up and get it out sooner because capitalism. I, I would like to design it. the labels of the vaccine. Think about it. Everyone's going to something for us right now. What's that? 
you got a pen right there, right? Sketch something what the, the coronavirus vaccine will look like. Here's what we're going to do. Watch this improvised fun. David we all, Corins. We all know what it's going to look like. Tony Award winning set designer David Corins is going to design a coronavirus vaccine label as we live stream. And then we're going to effing auction it off. And someone isn't, is. Isn't it so obvious what it looks like? I mean, we all no. have a picture of it. We all know. Don't I would draw a stick figure because that's all I can do. No, no, no. It's like this, obviously, oh. in 10, 9, Eight, this is like fun. Seven. It's like win, loser, draw, but with people who can really draw. There it is. Who's ready? Right Curtain comes up. This is very exciting. Wow, this is. <laughs> right? Uh... Throw a star, people. Throw a star. People, throw some stars for this. And said, David, sign that piece of paper as long as, like. Nike's you're... got a swoosh, but we've got. <laughs> the middle finger. To the... <laughs> this this is amazing. There it so is. listen, bid someone. To... <laughs> you have to put that on your Instagram or something or someone. Someone bid. We'll do a little silent auction. Someone email me. And uh, the the Canada the producers perspective .com and we'll we'll give it to the highest bidder. Uh, oh, amazing, God. well done. That, that, my heart is racing. By the way, I haven't picked up a pen in at least like nine weeks. So what have you been been doing? Like what with all you've got stuff going on. You've got a lot of projects. I'm sure they're obviously. I, I, I mean, we. I was in previews for uh, for Mrs. Doubtfire when this was all happening. Um, so that was. A, a huge drag because we were, you know, we, I think we had shown it to three audiences previews. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we all went home and then there was this crazy avalanche of emails saying, Hey, this show that you have is closing. Hey, this show is your closing. This one's closing. This one's closing. This one's closing. This one. it was, it was like insane. And I had um, gathered my studio together. There were about, 16 people working in the studio and and i sent everyone home with computers and we were so excited to like continue to hunker down and work and i and little did i know that that would be the last time we'd all be standing there you know everyone together you know ever because people have moved on um many of them have you know gotten other unemployment or left yeah. town or whatever um so what have i been doing i've been picking up the broken shards of my career and um, I got a Fitbit and I'm walking around my house a lot, uh, logging steps, getting in shape. And I'm trying to think of the great pivot. Have you figured it out yet? And would you share it with me? Um, I haven't figured it out yet, but I do, you know, my, my dirty little secret is that uh, theater is about 25% of my business. And so I, I was consulting with a lot of brands and institutions and organizations for, you know, for the last five or six years to try and help them tell their stories better. Um, and, you know, it's weird because there's all these really big, important companies that have huge communities globally and they have no way to, you know, sling their products and talk to their people. So it started with people saying, hey, can you make kind of virtual backgrounds, you know, for Zoom and things like that. But now people are looking for experiences that you can do together apart or that you can, you know, send to people's homes like experiences in a box. Um, hmm. So I'm kind of working on how to help companies that used to sell cars or used to sell things that you could interact with um, and have them reach you know, a bigger audience or an at-home audience. And it's been really fascinating, actually. Uh, it, it's not a live event, clearly, and, and that's really sad. I mean, I also have some live event projects that are so far out on the horizon that we're still in the ideation phase and the kind of design phase, so we've been working on that. But it's just been incredibly um, demoralizing and sad. You know, it's just been really sad. Um, my favorite time of the day is the 7 p.m. balcony cheer. Uh, I um, pulled out my trumpet, which I, I played a lot of instruments when I was younger. I pulled out a trumpet I hadn't played in about 25 years. Um, you have it. You, it's just hanging around your yeah, apartment. Yeah, I got all my instruments, and I've been playing a lot of music actually at home, writing songs and playing music daily. But the trumpet I pulled out, I literally had not touched it. Um, 
played a couple scales, went out and played kind of revelry. And then um, I had this idea that I would play the theme from New York, New York. And I did it two times. Another trumpet player started doing like a little call and recall. And then do you know they had this New York, New York sing along? That happened three days after I was playing New York, New York every day. And I got to say. It all started with you, Corinne. I don't know. Just saying. I was a trumpet player myself when I was a kid. Really? Yes. All the way through high school? What are we no, about? when I got braces, I gave it up. Oh, because, yeah. you know, course, it's like a yeah, That's basically like a chainsaw in your mouth. Oh, God, it was awful. Braces plus, plus. On the other side of this thing, I'm doing braces plus trumpet equals chainsaw. <laughs> the other reason I gave it up is because I just desperately did not want to be in marching band because we were just the biggest group of dorks around. I, just, I have a confession. I was in marching band my like whole career, and it was it's super dorky, but super incredible, actually. <laughs> I almost joined the drum and bugle corps, which is like <laughs> professional. It's like professional marching band. So why... How did you pivot, frankly, from being a marching band trumpeter to theater and set design? Well, because I wasn't actually only a marching band trumpeter, um, but I was in the choir. Like, let me let me pull out my resume of um, dorky, amazing things that I did in my life. Uh, I was in the choir. I was in the concert band, the jazz band, the marching band. Um, and one of the things that you would do if you were in the choir is you would be part of the Christmas with the Christmas. Uh, production, um, the play, and also the spring musical. And so that's how I got the bug. And it was also, and I was, a, I was a very, very competitive athlete. And it was interesting because basketball season, there was a very fancy tournament we always played in every year. And I was really good at basketball. And it, it conflicted every year with the Christmas play. And the woman who was the choral director and the director of the show would say to me, you get 20 something games, you only get one play. And I always had to make the choice of doing the play. And I always lost my spot on the starting lineup. And I always had to fight back after I got back from the Christmas play. But even back then, I was choosing theater over, you know, basically everything else. And now where are we? Yeah, look, you should have, you just have stuck with marching band. Or I know, I would have been, you know, a professional. Yeah, you would have screwed player. either way. You would have been without a gig if you were playing for the Knicks right now anyway. Yeah, obviously. Sure. That's true. That's true. See? So what, how do you think this will affect your designs of theater going forward? Like this, this is such a global worldwide event that affects everyone's soul and mind, including the audience, including the artists. Like, what do you think the theater looks like after this? Will it be different? Uh, well, I think there's no more premium price tickets, period. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that the theater, you know, I've been talking to my, you know, talking to myself first and then my staff about this. Um, I think there's a short term, a midterm and a long term. And when I say long term, I think like 18 months and beyond. So short term is like immediate, like let's get food. Um, I think obviously the theater's over for this moment um, unless it goes digital. Uh, I think what it looks like after 18 months is no different. I think it's gonna come back and it's gonna be fine. Although whether, you know, depending on how bad the financial crisis is, I'm not sure how much tourism there's going to be. Um, but I think design wise, it's going, not going to affect anything. Although I think that perhaps if there's, you know, lesser box office power, perhaps people are going to want to hunker down and make more creative design choices in general and just, you know, get, get lean and mean. But I feel like there's really two camps of that anyway on Broadway. You know, the, you, you listed off some shows that I have running right now and there's basically the like, you know, Hamilton and Dear Van Hansen both are pretty cheap shows to run. Mm -hmm. Very few motors, not a lot of scenery. That's kind of the nimble producing model anyway. And then you have like the big Disney-esque Warner Brothers blockbuster shows, which like only, you know, there's very few independent smaller producers who are doing things like that. Um, although interestingly, uh, Mrs. Doubtfire is a pretty big show, mm -hmm. scenically. So I think in general, you know, the trends eventually in the long term are going to be okay. I think that the theater going experience is going to change though. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if you read that crazy article when this was all just like a joke and people who were social distancing were kind of like, you know, germaphobes. But there was like, can you believe that at the theater, there's a longer um, timeline now for the men's bathroom because they're washing their hands. And I was like, wow, we shouldn't even talk about like what was going on pre like wash your hands for 20 seconds. But I think just the whole, you know, are we going to see people getting their temperatures taken? Are we going to get, you know, um, 
vaccine cards, you know, things like that. I don't really know what that's going to be, but I think China has a thing where on their smartphone, there's like a three color code, um, whether you've been infected or you're, you know, healthy or what that is, is like a red, green, yellow situation. So I don't know what that means for like timing in and out of the theater and like, it's a mess. It's a mess. It, it is a mess. There's no question. So you talk about these two different types. So Doubtfire, you said, surprisingly, Doubtfire is a pretty big show. What to you defines whether a show is going to be, requires a big design or something smaller? Like what, Hamilton, everyone, okay, the biggest hit Broadway has ever seen ever. So a layperson might think, oh, it must be the biggest spectacle ever, but it's not. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's interesting. I feel like, first of all, directorial vision and, you know, producerial vision. I think that you'll know pretty quickly when you get a phone call as a designer, what, what the general, um, gestalt is for, from the production where, you know, this is going to be built to last. Um, you know, I think Jeffrey Seller, Tommy Kale, they said to me, let's not wait on scenery. I mean, Hamilton was a different beast because we had so many different locations and such a crazy time period and everything. Um, to serve, we weren't going to make big scenery, but in general, um, you can't afford to have huge scenery if the show isn't for the whole audience. You know, there are almost no precedents that I can think of that have a big, massive, expensive set um, where it's not for the whole audience. I mean, you know, even Book of Mormon, which is not for the whole audience, uh, for you know, for all ages, um, it's not a lot of scenery on stage. So um, that's one of the telltale signs. I mean, that was the interesting thing about Beetlejuice is everyone thought that the show was not um, sustainable because of the language and the content and all that. We actually made the show um, more family friendly. And I think something happened where the Venn diagram of like, uh, all of a sudden it became the cool show for people, like the cool new first young audience. But it's not like Lion King young. It's like, 11, 12, 13 year old young. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's like it's demographic driven mostly. What's the first thing you do when you are going to design a show? So you read a script. What What's the, this, I ask this question because I really don't know what a designer's first step would be. Research. I mean, the, first thing I, the first thing I normally do is I, I talk to the director briefly and, a, and ask, you know, if they have any kind of guiding principles so I can kind of plant the seed in my head before I read it. And then I definitely read it. Now, the first thing I'll do when I, when I uh, design a show is drop to my knees and kiss the feet of the person that hired me. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy out there. Uh, no, I mean, you have to read. You always start with the material. You read um, the piece first. Um, you know, I was thinking about how things are going to change. Um, I think experiences are going to be completely different. You know, I've been hired to do something that's a, a kind of a fully immersive walkthrough experience. And, you know, eight short weeks ago, we could have had a room where there was like flavor tasting or something. And there's no way. I, I don't even think with um, a vaccine, I think that the, the kind of collective consciousness of everyone is going to be like, I, you know, I was thinking about um, collaborating with this artist who makes kind of full environments that you kind of chill, like almost like fur caves. And I was thinking like, it's gonna be a long time before people are hanging out in a fur cave. I mean, which is maybe a perfect segue to talk about your apartment decor. <laughs> That's the other because room. The old apartment, yeah. which I designed, had a fur cave. It did have a fur cave. about the Davenport fur cave. Yes, exactly. Uh, one of the reasons I, I like working with you is that you are a set designer, frankly, that enjoys dramaturgy so I, and, and is very, very good at it. So I always feel like I'm getting a, look, you're a very expensive designer nowadays, but I feel like I'm getting two for one if I'm getting David Corns on, on a show wow. because I'm not only getting a designer, I'm getting someone that's going to help. And now you get a three for one because I'm going to kiss the feet. So you get three <laughs> two shines. Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, you've seen a lot of shows. You've seen a lot of new shows. What's the one biggest issue you've seen with a show as they try as in their development? Like, do you, Is there a common note you see that writers struggle with the most? That you're like, oh, I hope they do this. I, if they ask me, I'm going to do this. How am I going to, like, what's the one thing you've seen in your, from your perspective? Well, I actually, you know, it's funny. We all, 
mostly, although I guess now people studying theater probably study different shows than I did. But um, when I was coming up, we were studying kind of classical shows, which were every writer writes kind of what they know, right? So back in the day, plays were written very economically, scenographically. People who are writing shows now write what they know, and they grew up in the kind of MTV, YouTube generation. So they're writing kind of hard cuts, multiple locations, you know, things that aren't necessarily on the page, like well-made as a scenographic puzzle. Um, you know, think about like old school box sets. Act one looked like this, act two looked like this, that kind of thing. Um, and I always feel like it's not the set designer's job to change that. Like something that's in the DNA of the show is what's in the DNA of the show. Like yeah. Dear Evan Hansen, we knew right away there was gonna be video. We knew right away there was gonna be, you know, FaceTiming essentially. Um, and that we knew that the, uh, we knew that the internet and going kind of in and being immersed in the internet was gonna be a character. It was gonna be at least two or three scenes in the show. And that's, I think Pasek Paul and Levinson wrote that because that they grew, they're young, they grew up with that, you know. Um, I, I think, so I think that it's not necessarily that people make a pitfall. I think that they write what they know and the theater presentation is kind of old school in technology. Um, and that we have to, as designers and creatives, catch up to the worlds that are being um, written. And I think oftentimes the solve for that is like less scenery. And I don't think it has to be that. I just think it has to be kind of like deeper um, mind conversations about what people are really getting at. And I think why you think that I'm a good dramaturg, and thank you for the compliment, is because I really try and like distill down and crystallize what is the writer trying to get at, you know? And sometimes they're like, well, it has to happen in like this bodega. And you think like, but why? And mm. you really have the luxury of talking to a live playwright. Um, frequently it's not, it doesn't have to happen in that bodega. Um, and then they realize, oh, actually it's just like where this character, you know, delivers the I want song and it could be anywhere. Mm. Um, so you, you, I think, what you have to do as a creative now is sort of say, is this thing written because in your DNA as a writer, you are used to seeing things jump cut and you know slash away to other locations, or is it because that's actually the vocabulary of the show? And then we can move ahead and have a real dialogue. Hmm. Uh, let's take some, some questions here. Uh, what is your favorite way of pitching a design to a client? Physical models or sketches on the back of a grocery list like you just did with your coronavirus logo? Um, in person, hello. Uh, you know, what? it's interesting. It's the, I'll talk about a double-edged sword. Um, by the time you get to a model, you, what you've got going for you is that uh, scale doesn't lie. You know, there's no way to shade a drawing to, to you know, Jedi mind trick someone into buying it. A model mm -hmm. is, what it, it is what it is scale-wise. But more and more and more people are looking for renderings and, and detail. Um, and they, because they are frequently in color, they can really kind of help sell a thing. I, I found myself in the last five or six years delivering and pitching with um, sketches and renderings. And then only when you go further along in the process do you get the model form. Here's a very specific question and a very good one. To what extent is a set built into a theater for example, the trap door, they jump through Beetlejuice, because if you don't know your theater before you're coming in, this is often the case right now. I mean, I, with Beetlejuice, you may have known you were going to the Winter Garden, but when you're designing a show, like you said, there's some in ideation phase. Do you design for theaters? What? How do you do it? Uh, well, the, the puzzle of Broadway is actually pretty interesting. So like the, the idea that you um, will know the exact theater is fairly rare. I'd say like 15 or 20 percent of the time you know where you're going. And that's always very, very helpful. When you don't know, because at least before before the Roni, as I call it, um, before the Roni, you kind of knew the shows that were gonna stick around and you knew the shows that were gonna turn over. And it, it's basically like one of seven show, one of seven theaters. So Broadway theaters are basically the same size. Some have space on stage left, some have space on stage right, some are super narrow, some are very big, although those theaters are rare to come up. And what you do is you design all you can. And then if there's a trap, you like hope and pray. Um, we knew from DC that we were going into the Winter Garden so we could put that trap. Um, the super, super secret hush hush, my, my hope and dream to move Beetlejuice. Um, I am looking at a, uh, yeah, that's right. 
I saw Ken's eyebrows go up. He's looking for a little inside Exclusive. scoop. Sure. Only for stars, people. Only for stars. Harry Butler's on tomorrow. So, you know, unfortunately, the actors don't know nothing about nothing, right? <laughs> That's just the way it is. <laughs> Blue collar workers. <laughs> love them. Um, uh, I love all the actors. Uh, like, here's the thing. We, we um, have to try and look at the land, the real estate landscape, and you design um, for your lowest common denominator first, and then you get right. real specific. And you, and sometimes you design five different versions of Beetlejuice for a transfer. The Barrymore, the Broadway, the... Hang on one second. Broadway? I'm just gonna name all the Bs. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I knew that answer, we'd have a theater. It's just exciting that it's still in the word. Like that's the like I put a press release out right now. David Corrins talks about possible transfer of Beetlejuice. It's still possible, everybody. Just follow possible. my Twitter and Instagram. You know I'm talking about possible transfers. Come on. <laughs> uh, oh God damn it! I had a question in there that I was going to ask about that now, and I'd lost. Oh, but Wayne Stafford, it looks like we may have a new job for you. You said you needed a gig. Do you offer dramaturgy as a service? A hundred percent. I'm but taking I might 10%. Only just one foot, not both. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But yes, yeah. sure, why not? Uh, uh, let's see here. Oh, here's someone that just wants you to stay positive. I'm just in the writing process of my play. I can't stop thinking about scene design. In which part of the creative process do you uh, used to get involved? So, how early in a process do you jump in? Um, I, I will come in as early as possible. I think, I think there's, um, you know, all information is good information. I think you learn at every single step. And I have um, been involved with things when they're only the first act is written. And I've been involved with things, you know, it's all fully done and buttoned up. And they're like, hey, you know, we need, we need someone now. Um, and it's over. I, uh, I, I'm excited to be part of the process because I think um, free, you know, one plus one equals three you know, in this business, we, we go to graduate school and I didn't, but people that do go to graduate school, they get a master of fine arts. And I, that was, that one was always quizzical to me because I, I feel like what we do is a collaborative art, not necessarily a fine art. I feel like what you do with a fine art is go into a, you, you could go into your backyard and make a thing. And then it could show to the world, like a painting or a sculpture, a fine art, but we cannot do what we do without hundreds, if not thousands of people, including the actors and everything else. And so the earlier, the better hmm. for me. Uh, looks like we have a lot of future David Corns on this live stream. What is your advice to aspiring set designers? Um, well, stay healthy, uh, number one. Um, uh, I would say see as much work as you possibly can read as many books, TV shows, movies as you can, find someone whose work you admire, reach out to them, learn from them. Um, and, you know, I, I, and, I, and I, I would say, take this advice, do as I say, not as I do. Really learn how to draw, paint, <laughs> render, sculpt, do all those things. Um, I had to learn kind of backward I started doing and then I realized I was only kind of building and painting and propping and designing square sets because that's the only thing I could draw. And then over the years, I had to challenge myself to sit down in the sketchbook and my designs got crazier and more ambitious as my drawing and communication skills got better. So I would say do all those things and like find someone to mentor you. It's, it really is an oral society and you do get better and better and better as you do it. I think back to myself as a 21, 22, 23 year old designer. And I remember thinking, oh, I think I'm pretty good. And now, and you know, now looking back, I think, wow, I really didn't know much. Hmm. Tips for all of us out there trying to stay positive and stay creative during this time. And I know, listen, you've said to me privately, you've said like, this is crazy, it's dark time, but even you found a way to pull out your old trumpet and get on that, lean out your window and inspire people to sing New York, New York. So what, what should the rest of us do? I mean, listen, I really believe that this is a gift. 
I, I re I, you know, that I, I know that many people are sick. I lost my uncle to the virus. Oh, um, you know, it's, it's a really incredibly trying time. Uh, you know, I like everyone else or like many people are, I'm unemployed too. So I'm, I'm scared. I'm nervous, but this is a gift when in recent or distant history, have we been able to been afforded time to sit and like learn a hobby, get in shape, work on meditation, um, whatever it is, you know, my, my girlfriend is here with me, um, where my kids are back and forth and we have meditated, we've connected with board games, we've done drawings and paintings, playing music. Um, you know, I just feel like there's so many things and no one could ever say, I didn't have the time to do this. We're also like barreling our way through Ozark, but like the truth is, this is that moment in history where, you know, Mother Earth is in a way healing herself. Um, you know, there are people who are going to get real rich and really successful based on the time that they've spent thinking and ideating on interesting ideas. And I'm not suggesting you should do that for money reasons. You should be generous and calm if you can. But this is a huge opportunity we've been given to spend time with our families, each other, and just think. And, you know, my kids preschool head of school said, let your kids be bored because boredom is the second before inspiration. And if you allow yourself to get to that place, something freaking crazy is going to come into your head. And then that crazy idea might be the thing that, like, saves us all. And then I've got the label for it. <laughs> Save that label. We're going to auction it off. Uh, and put it on your Instagram, and everyone should follow David on Instagram. I don't know if Mary, who I think is like watching someone else's live stream right now from the looks of her backstage, um, she'll throw up your Instagram to, <laughs> to every. She's not. I'm just teasing her. Uh, she'll throw up your Instagram for everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank it you. Means the world. We live very close to each other. I cannot wait to listen for that I, trumpet. I will. Number one. And we'll share a slice at the pizza place when this is all over, six feet sure. apart. We will sure. do it. Thanks, my friend. Good to see you. Thank you. David Corrins, everybody. I told you he was more than just a set designer, philosopher, and dramaturge as well, and now offering his services for that. You can check out his Instagram. Mary will throw that up or throw it in the comments for you to follow him. He's a terrific guy and a terrific theater maker as well. We're very thankful he was here. And if you liked him and what he had to say, throw some stars at us, throw some tips into that Actors Fund donation. We're getting up there. As soon as we hit a certain number, I'm gonna show you my Corona cut. It's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be interesting. We're getting there. So tomorrow, yes, we continue the Beetlejuice run. We have Carrie Butler, one of my favorite performers uh, here in the city, one of my favorite Broadway actresses, Carrie Butler, always super fun. She'll be with us tomorrow night. Don't forget that you can watch all of the guests we've had from the past on replay on my Facebook page. So go watch them all. You can also continue to donate to the Actors Fund. So if you've missed one, go just like, forget about Ozark, David Korn, stop watching Ozark and just binge watch all of the replays. That's what you can do. Don't forget to stay safe, stay healthy, and stay home, everybody. And now, tonight, this is becoming like the most popular part of the show. Uh, something to make you smile. We're going to leave you with something to make you smile. Tonight's our version of good news. So much video is being created all over the web by all of us Broadway folks. And here's one. I mean, I'd listen to this song without this video. And then when you see this video, it, you're going to tear up. You're going to tear up. All of the cast of Jersey Boys, all of them got together to sing Who Loves You? Yes, that one. Who loves you, pretty baby? We're gonna, that one, you're gonna love it. Go to theproducersperspective.com backslash smile and watch that video and have a wonderful, wonderful night. And remember who loves you? We all love you. We all love you. I love you. Everyone who loves the theater loves you. We're all in this together. We're gonna get through it. We'll see you tomorrow night with Carrie Butler. Thanks everybody. We're getting the band back together.